know what this is, do you? It's a pirate medallion. This is Aztec gold. Heathen gods placed upon the gold. A terrible curse. The drink would not satisfy. Food turned to ash in our mouths. There's one way we can end our curse. The moonlight shows us for what we really are. We are not among the living, and so we cannot die. You best start believing in ghost stories, Miss Turner. You're in one. Written by Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio and directed by Gore Verbinski, The Pirates of the Caribbean The Curse of the Black Pearl is a 2003 fantasy film, a career-defining project for Johnny Depp, and easily one of the most successful pirate films ever made. I got excited listening to Gore explain his vision of the project because he has the, the energy of, of a little kid. Before The Pirates of the Caribbean was an award-winning, multi-billion dollar franchise, it was a ride at Disney's premier theme park in Anaheim, California. In addition to being one of the most popular attractions, it was the final ride that Walt Disney helped design before passing away in 1966. Initially conceived as a type of narrative wax museum, Walt and the other designers decided to use the same water ride concept as the It's a Small World attraction, following its notable popularity at the 1964 New York World's Fair. The end result had people enjoying a 15-minute boat ride through an explosive pirate adventure that included ship battles and caves full of treasure. After its debut at Disneyland in March of 1967, it became a massive success, leading to its duplication in other parks around the world, including Disneyland in Tokyo, Paris, and Shanghai. Toward the end of the 90s, Disney began adapting some of their flagship theme park rides into full-length feature films, including the 1997 made-for-television film Tower of Terror starring Kirsten Dunst and Steve Guttenberg. The company continued their pursuit and included Pirates of the Caribbean in their list of rides to be adapted. In 2001, the film division of Disney tasked game show producer Jay Wolpert with writing a script. In the first iteration, Will Turner was a guard that breaks Jack Sparrow out of prison to rescue Elizabeth Swan. In March of 2002, they brought in Australian director and screenwriter Stuart Beatty, a knowledgeable pirate buff, to rewrite the script. Basically read every book on piracy. Uh, lots of great, wonderful books by you know, first-hand accounts or by uh, history professors. Or, and also studied all those films that we wanted to emulate, all the, the Errol Flynn films, the Seahawk, the Captain Bloods, you know, right. all those great things. Around the same time, chairman of Walt Disney Motion Pictures, Dick Cook, hired producer Jerry Bruckheimer, but there were creative differences right off the bat. After reading the draft, Bruckheimer stated it was too derivative of past pirate films and lacked anything new. To fix this, he hired screenwriters Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio, who had worked together on the road to El Dorado and Shrek. Years prior, Ted Elliott had been writing an adaptation of the classic pirate-themed video game Monkey Island, but the project was cancelled. Using concepts from that, along with other ideas they'd been throwing around since the 90s, the pair suggested that the Pirates of the Caribbean have a supernatural twist. The way you get an audience to really embrace a movie is go against the grain. It was so much fun, and it looks like so much fun when you see it. You know, you're going to come out of there and go be bubbling with excitement. With Bruckheimer Police, Gore Verbinski, who just wrapped up production on The Ring, was high to direct. The pirates are going to be very authentic and have the fear and the loathing that you want them to have, and yet you're going to have a lot of humor with that. So that's why we have Gore. I loved Captain Blood, Crimson Pirate, um, you know, all of those movies. It's just that. There's something about piracy. With fond memories of the ride, reverence for the bygone age of swashbuckling films, and a keen eye for horror, Verbinski leapt at the opportunity to resurrect the genre. Unfortunately, after the 2002 film Country Bears flopped at the box office, CEO Michael Eisner saw the production of The Pirates of the Caribbean as another waste of money and attempted to shut it down. Sure, the film ended up being a massive hit that launched the franchise, but nobody knew that was going to happen, so his complaints over the huge $140 million budget for a film based on a theme ride were reasonable. Assured by Verbinski and Bruckheimer that they would not go over budget and that they wanted to make the best film they could, Eisner decided to let them create with no oversight. Filming began in October of 2002 and wrapped up five months later. Refusing to shoot a movie about pirates in the Caribbean anywhere other than the Caribbean, they chose the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines as their primary locations. We picked St. Vincent because it didn't have much. You know, it had a few piers in the water. We extended that one pier, and then we augmented a couple of existing buildings, and then we added to the town so we could make it look like our universal backlot. 
Many docks were built on location, as well as a backlot to film the scenes set in the town of Tortuga, while the larger sets were built back in California, including the Port Royal Fortress, as well as Governor Swan's Palace. They even crafted two of the three ships featured in the film. The HMS Dauntless and the Black Pearl were partially built and CGI was used to fill in the gaps, but the HMS Interceptor was actually a functioning full-scale replica that made the 40-day voyage to reach the Caribbean. The Lady Washington uh, plays the Interceptor, the fastest ship in the British fleet. Lady Washington is a period reproduction of the first American vessel to make landfall on the Pacific Northwest coast back in 1789. BT and Verbinski rose to the task of creating an interesting world founded in pirate lore, but it's the characters that pull most of the weight. The movie does an excellent job representing the chaotic motivation and blurry morals of pirates, and those trying to curb the dying lifestyle. This is perfectly embodied in Captain Jack Sparrow, the heart of the series, and an affable anti-hero who goes out of his way to protect others, while always somehow managing to look out for himself. Pirate or not, this man saved my life. One good deed is not enough to redeem a man of a lifetime of wickedness. <laughs> You're despicable. Sticks and stones, love. I saved your life, you saved mine, we're square. Betrayed by his crew and left to die, this supposed scum of the sea is often braver and more honourable than the authorities he evades. This serves as a shining example for Will Turner, who starts the film as a misguided soul without a father, but finds purpose and confidence in his heritage. You know, for having such a bleak outlook on pirates, you're well on your way to becoming one. Even the villains, while reprehensible and undeniably criminal, are somewhat sympathetic in their plight. Better yet, the movie doesn't downplay the violent and selfish nature of its pirates, leaving the audience to judge the strengths and weaknesses of each character alone, something unheard of in films we've been tortured by lately. For too long I've been parched of thirst and unable to quench it. Too long I've been starving to death and haven't died. I feel nothing. The Curse of the Black Pearl starts in 1720, with the young Elizabeth and her father, Governor Weatherby Swan, sailing toward the town of Port Royal on the HMS Dauntless. When the crew rescues a boy named Will Turner from a flaming shipwreck, Elizabeth notices his golden medallion and hides it. Eight years later, she's still in possession of the necklace, and Will toils away as an honourable blacksmith's apprentice, with an unspoken bond between them. I dream about you last night, about the day we met, do you remember? How could I forget, Miss Swan? Will, how many times must I ask you to call me Elizabeth? At least once more, Miss Swan. This is why she's caught off guard when Commodore James Norrington of the British Royal Navy proposes to her. With her corset suffocating her, she faints and falls into the ocean to be rescued by Captain Jack Sparrow, who's just comically arrived in town to commit a bit of piracy. What's your purpose? Yeah, and no lies. It is my intention to commandeer one of these ships, raid, pillage, plunder, and otherwise build for my Weasley Black Guts out. I said no lies! Despite his heroic act, as a pirate, Sparrow is hunted across town and eventually imprisoned after a sword fight with Will Turner. I practice three hours a day so that when I meet a pirate, I can kill it! Excellent work, Mr. Brown. Just doing my civic duty, sir. The action ramps up that night when the town is attacked by the infamous pirate ship the Black Pearl, commanded by Captain Hector Barbosa. Stricken by a curse of pleasureless immortality for stealing a bounty of Aztec gold, the crew seeks the medallion she wears as it is the final piece of treasure that must be returned to its source. And so, Elizabeth is kidnapped and taken to sea. Upset at the lack of urgency in her rescue, Will strikes up a deal with Jack Sparrow, who claims to be the previous captain of the Black Pearl, and breaks him out of prison, later securing a boat and a crew on the rowdy island of Tortuga. Commodore, he's disabled the rudder chain, sir. That's got to be the best pirate I've ever seen. So it would seem. Tracking the Black Pearl to Isla de Muerta, Will learns of his true heritage as a son of Bootstrap Bill, a pirate who sailed under Jack's command when he was captain of the Black Pearl. I swear you look just like him. It's not true. He was a merchant sailor. He was a bloody pirate, a scallywag. My father was not a pirate. Locating the cursed pirates, Will and Jack are able to rescue her the moment Barbosa realizes she's not of Turner lineage and will not satiate the blood sacrifice required to lift the curse. Loyalties are tested as a battle breaks out, resulting in the capture of Will and the dumping of Elizabeth and Jack on a remote island in the middle of the sea. That's the second time I've ever watched that man sail away with my ship. Luckily, their crew and the rest of the Navy save the day, making way for Will and Jack to defeat Barbosa. You carry that pistol now. You waste your shard. He didn't waste it. 
Back at Port Royal, Sparrow is sentenced to be hanged for piracy, but manages to escape with the help of Will and his crew. When Elizabeth finally proclaims her love for Will, he is pardoned for his actions, and their union is approved by the governor as Jack sails away, returning to his role as the captain of the Black Pearl. Thought you were supposed to keep to the code. We figured there were more actual guidelines. From the start, the movie immerses us in the vibrant yet dirty atmosphere of 18th century piracy, with a decidedly serious tone, period accurate sets and costumes, some comic relief, and a bit of mystical intrigue. You best start believing in ghost stories, Miss Turner. You're in one. With this emphasis on world building and character development, The Curse of the Black Pearl plays out at an exciting pace, balancing its narrative with raw action and thrills. Thanks to the focus on practical effects, scenes of battle and destruction feel satisfyingly bombastic. Sword fights play out in rhythmic fashion, aided by musical flourishes and the fantastic score composed by Klaus Badolt and Hans Zimmer. Even with its hefty use of CGI in some scenes, the visual effects still hold up decades later, which speaks volumes to Gore Verbinski's skill in melding CGI with practical effects, stunt work and cinematography. There's no shortage of praise for the performances either. It's hard to see anyone else but Johnny Depp as Captain Jack Sparrow. Depp oozes rockstar charisma and irrefutable charm, stealing every scene he waltzes through and leading the rest of the cast with his infectious energy. No! Not good! You burned all the food, the shade! The rum! Yes! The rum is gone! Why is the rum gone? Orlando Bloom does a decent job as Will Turner, serving as an avatar for the audience that has a satisfying arc. Kira Knightley is also solid as Elizabeth, subverting her roots as a damsel in distress before becoming a heroine in her own right, while Jonathan Price is always terrific in anything period related. That said, heroes are made better when faced with worthy opposition, and Jeffrey Rush provides that in spades with his delightfully evil turn as Captain Barbosa. Did it work? I don't feel no different. How do we tell? He shot me! The Curse of the Black Pearl offers big budget thrills akin to an amusement park ride, while still focusing on character, reinforced by career defining performances by Johnny Depp and Jeffrey Rush. Considering Hollywood abandoned the swashbuckling genre in the mid 90s, and any sense of decency before that, The Curse of the Black Pearl proves that you don't need to reinvent the wheel to produce a hit, you just need to make it spooky. By simply casting the best actors for the role, letting creative minds work without restriction, and not sacrificing the story to push a political agenda, Disney created a very unexpected but welcomed hit. This is the day that you will always remember as the day that you...